and participation is vacillating. All right, so I think we're at a good time to start. So I'd like to welcome everyone to welcome everyone to James Thompson Thompson's second lecture. And because I can read the, the, the outline, I see we're gonna make a gradual transformation from entirely classical physics to a bit of quantum physics, probably interpreted mostly in a classical framework. Yeah. So anyway, thanks, James. All right, great. So, um, you know, I think the point of a summer school is to make sure you learn something. Um, so, you know, in the previous lecture, we started with classical harmonic oscillators. We talked about their steady state response, their amplitude phase and IQ response. We saw that uh, in steady state response to a drive, the, the, the response, the phaser maps out a circle in the IQ plane. We thought about sort of a different picture of impulsive responses or Green's functions and why that where the phase shift comes from uh, in this perspective of, in some sense, the, the, the harmonic oscillator always wants to tick at its natural rate. So if you give it a kick, that kick is going to, in some sense, propagate in time at the natural resonance frequency um, of the harmonic oscillator. Uh, we also talked about frequency modulation uh, in the small modulation frequency limit. And then we also talked about in the large frequency modulation limit, which is a parametric drive where we're modulating at two times the resonance frequency of the harmonic oscillator. And what we saw is we got a squeezing mechanism in phase space. This is exactly the kind of parametric drive underlines physics associated with, for instance, squeezing optical fields, uh, squeezing um, mechanical motion and ion traps. It underlies uh, quantum noise limited amplifiers called just so parametric amplifiers. It's being employed in ion traps now uh, for, for instance, protocols to speed up gates and achieve higher fidelities. Um, that's what we talked about. And I'd like to pause and see if there are any questions uh, that, you know, after you walked away, you said, yeah, wait a minute. Now that I think about it, I'm confused about that. So let me pause for a minute. Um, I had a question. Uh, so you showed these two sort of different ways of getting solutions, one where you modulated with some omega m and you motivated this perturbative scheme. Mm -hmm. But when you showed at the end where you modulated with the twice the resonant frequency, you motivated a different kind of a solution where you did not use that perturbative scheme. Does it fail or? Um, there, There is still a little bit of, uh, well, OK. What I am doing is doing perturbation with respect to, I'll point out that there is this term right here that I'll circle uh, that we dropped. Sorry, I didn't mean to include the A epsilon. It's the cosine three omega naught T term. That's the term that uh, you have to drop and, and that's a perturbative uh, correction in the system. Um, it's really that in some sense, you know, once you kind of know what you ought to guess, it's like all things, it's the beauty of an onsatz. Once you've actually figured out what the system is, then you can show, given this onsatz, that you can get self-consistent behavior. Are there any other questions? It's a great one. So um, I'm happy to be interrupted, uh, but I'm going to start going once, going twice, going three times. Great. Um, so today we're going to start by talking about how we can think of a driven uh, optical cavity as a harmonic oscillator. Okay. Um, make sure that we're in a reasonable view here. Okay, optical cavity as harmonic oscillator. Okay, um, here's where we're gonna be. Uh, we're gonna look at this and say, if what is an optical cavity? Well, an optical cavity is that I have some mirror, and I'll draw it as curved because it turns out that we don't like to use plane waves inside cavities because it's unstable. But if we use slightly curved mirrors, we can build stable modes. I'll draw it as slightly curved. Um, and it turns out that if I, you know, imagine I send a photon uh, at this thing, 
uh, there's a question, you know, what's the probability that it gets through to the other side? Okay. And that probability we can describe via a power transmission coefficient, big T. Okay. So a uh, photon hits the mirror. What's the probability it transmits? We'll call that big T. You can also think of that as if I send a watt of power at this mirror, what's the fraction of power that makes it through? That's what big T. So it's talking about power, not field. It's the power transmission coefficient. We can also think of it as there's a reflection coefficient, probability of reflection. And we're going to assume that those are the only things that can happen to the photon. So we can say that um, you know, R is equal to one minus T. Because the probabilities have to sum to one. R plus T is equal to one. Now we're going to have a uh, second mirror sitting over here. And for the moment, we're going to take that it has the same reflection coefficient and transmission coefficient. And we're going to send some light described by some electric field EI for E incident. And then what's going to happen is that we're going to get a total reflected field over here that reflects off this mirror. And I'll label that E sub R. Now it turns out that we also are going to transmit a little bit of field inside this cavity and it's going to circulate inside the cavity. So I'm going to draw one round trip here. It comes back around. And I'm going to choose some plane right here. And I'm going to say that the electric field, the, cir the circulating electric field is E sub C. And then there's a transmitted field over here, E sub T for E transmitted. What else do I need? Well, this cavity has some spacing, which we will call L. And the reflected field we should keep in mind uh, and we'll come back to this later, it's going to have two components. It's going to have a contribution from the fact that the incident electric field bounces off, right? It's, it's just a mirror. So some of this is just bouncing right off. But then some of it is that I'm going to build up some large circulating electric field inside this cavity and some of it leaks back out. And so ER is going to have two contributions and we'll come back to that later. But let's keep that in mind. Okay, so the C refers to circulating. T here refers to transmitted field. And the R here is the net reflected field. It's going to include all contributions, including the light leaking out of the cavity. Okay. So these are power reflection. and transmission. Okay, great. So let's say that we have some light at wavelength lambda. And we can associate some k vector, some k, num k associated with that, which is just going to be equal to two pi over lambda. You can also associate a frequency, an angular frequency with it, which is going to be omega is equal to C times K, okay? Uh, what is that? Well, just remember that this is two pi times C over lambda, C over lambda is F, the frequency of the light. Let's ask ourselves, in steady state, what must be the various relationships among these fields? So, the circulating field right now is equal to the latest little dribble of electric field that leaks through the input mirror, which is the mirror on the left. And it leaks through the, the electric field transmission coefficient is the square root of big T. So this is sort of the light that just made it into the cavity, plus the old light from the previous uh, round trip which was EC, but then it bounces off of one mirror and it bounces off of another mirror. And both of those have electric field reflection coefficients, big R, take the square root, square root of big R. Okay, cool. 
So now there's also the fact that there's a round trip phase that I accumulate as I go around the cavity. So I also pick up an e to the i 2kl in round trip. So kl worth of phase as I go uh, from the input mirror to the output mirror, and then a kl worth of, of phase in radians coming all the way back. I take one bounce off of each mirror. So I get a square root of R, big R each time. And so in the end, this just becomes big R because of the symmetry of the mirrors. Okay, so we can just solve this. So we can say in steady state, EC is equal to the square root of big T times the incident electric field divided by one minus R times E to the I, sorry, E to the two, I, K, L. Okay. That's it. Um, you've, you've solved for sort of the response to the cavity. You know what the circulating field is. Let's see if we can simplify this a little bit. And in fact, let's work in the limit where we're thinking about what are called very high finesse cavities or cavities that actually have very, very highly reflective mirrors, such that the, you know, the, the power transmission coefficient could be of order 10 to the minus four or even smaller. So let's think about that limit. And let's let uh, k be equal to k naught plus a, a small deviation. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in just a second, plus a delta k, such that the 2 k naught l is equal to some integer number of 2 pi. So by doing that, that allows us to take the e to the 2 i k l and do an expansion so that this becomes 1 plus i 2 delta k times l. Now here's the thing. We're going to assume that we took out the bulk of the k, right, to get this integer number of 2 pi. So in this expansion, the reason we could do it is because this is small. So we have two small things in the problem, or at least in this perturbative limit we're going to do of a high finesse cavity. We have this phase factor, and we also have uh, this small power transmission coefficient. So there are two things that are small. What we're going to do is we're gonna try and simplify only keeping to of order small and ignoring all terms of order small squared, okay? Keep only terms. order small, so first power, ignore small squared. Great. So this allows us to look at this result. So the one up here, and we're going to now expand things out and say this is equal to root t times e incident divided by one minus, and now I'm gonna write in terms of small quantity, big T, so one minus uh, big T, that's how I'm writing big R, times one plus I two delta K L. So we said we're only gonna keep of order uh, small, not small squared. So that means that we can write this as root T times E incident divided by one minus one, minus two I delta K L plus T. So what you see is that these ones cancel each other out over here. So what we're gonna be left over in the denominators with things that are only small, and that's gonna to lead to a very large enhancement in the circulating electric field. It's that cancellation of the one that we wanted. So now let me just simplify this out. We have EC, is equal to square root of t times e incident divided by big T yep. times one minus, I'm gonna write it in a funny way, two i delta k l over big T. Okay. So there's a specific frequency, omega cavity or omega naught, 
which is associated with the K naught. Okay, so when we did this, we can say, look, there is a resonance condition that gives me this N2 pi, which I could say, well, that's when omega C is equal to the speed of light times K naught over here. So we can define how far is our drive detuned from this resonance condition in frequency. And so we can define delta detuning via delta K is equal to delta divided by C. I think I'm gonna move that. And so we're going to stop thinking in Ks or inverse wavelengths and start thinking in frequency. And specifically angular frequency. Okay, so when we do that, delta here is really saying that delta is the actual drive frequency omega of the incident field minus the cavity resonance frequency. Okay, so let's plug that in. And what we're going to have now is that EC is equal to E incident divided by, we have a net square root of big T on the bottom, one over one minus I delta times two L over C divided by big T. Okay. So in physics, um, there is a transition where you go from doing math to doing physics when you start putting parentheses around them and trying to get physical meanings to things, okay? At least that's how I think. So let's look at this and ask, what is this combination of 2L over C divided by T? Okay, well, let's start with the 2L uh, over C. Well, it turns out that the time it takes the field or a photon to make a round trip in the cavity, well, that's just the round trip length, 2L divided by the speed of light. So the 2L over C is just the round trip time. Okay. Now, what's the probability that the photon escapes in a single round trip? Well, the probability that the photon, so this is the round trip time, escapes in single round trip, call that P escape. Well, it, it hits the first mirror. Okay, let's, let's just come here. We started this, we started the plane here and we move this way. I don't know if you can see it getting darker. I hit that mirror and the probability I, I transmit is big T. I come back around, I bounce off of the input mirror, the probability I escape there is big T. So in one round trip, the probability, because T is very small, these just sum, is two times big T. So now let's ask yourself, what's the rate at which the photon would exit, a photon would exit the cavity? Well, that's just saying, well, what's the probability that I escape divided by how often I try? How many times per second I try? And so this is actually the decay rate over here. So that's called the power decay rate associated with the cavity. It has units of uh, per second. And so what that says is we can actually assign a line width associated with their cavity mode, a power decay line width, which is one over one minus I delta divided by kappa over two. This is the circulating power. Let's go up and look at the transmitted power. The transmitted power, I'm gonna ignore propagation phases in all of this, okay? So I'm gonna ignore the fact that there's a phase shift e to the i 2kl, or sorry, e to the i kl, 
as I move from the initial plane that I defined just after the input mirror uh, to the output mirror. So I'm gonna ignore that one. So up to that phase, the E transmitted is nothing more than the square root of the power transmission coefficient times E circulating. And so in this case, in the symmetric cavity, that just ends up being E incident divided by one minus I delta divided by kappa over two squared. Sorry, no nope, squared, no squared on it yet. Great. What about the reflected field? So we are going to ignore for a moment that the circulating field bounces off this mirror, the output mirror at this end, and it gets reduced by a factor of big R, but big R is so close to one, we're going to ignore it. But then it comes to this, uh, to the input mirror, it bounces back to here and it transmits, okay? And it turns out that the promptly reflected field the one that comes from, well, I've got fresh field coming in from the left and headed to the right, and it bounces off and gives a contribution, which is nothing more than big R, sorry, square root of big R times, um, times E incident. Square root. But now I also have the plus, I'm sorry, minus, square root, so the field transmission coefficient square root of a t times e circulating. Let's take this number to be of order one. So now we can reduce e reflected to be equal to e incident times one minus one over one plus i delta divided by kappa over two. We box some of these. So these are the expressions for a symmetric cavity where the mirrors have uh, equal transmission coefficients um, in a high finesse cavity. In other words, a cavity where the, the mirrors have very high reflection coefficients. And what you see is that actually it has the same Lorentzian response as our harmonic oscillator. Okay, so think about it. Let's look at E transmitted here. Let's look at E transmitted uh, magnitude squared. Well, that's nothing more than E incident squared, which you can think of as the incident power, divided by one plus delta divided by kappa over two quantity squared. So it looks like a Lorentzian. So as I scan and I look at the transmitted power, I'll get some transmitted power that looks like so. But even more than that, this is a generic feature. This, when I have a one over one plus I delta kind of um, dependence on detuning, that means that when we actually look at, for instance, the circulating field and the transmitted field, we can think in this I and Q language over here, that actually the, the transmitted and circulating field maps out a circle, just like in a harmonic oscillator. I'm doing my best to draw a circle. So over here, this is when you have peak transmitted field, and this happens at a detuning of zero when you're on resonance with the cavity. You're up here at about 45 degrees, at 45 degrees when you have delta equals plus kappa over two. You're down here when you have delta equals minus kappa over two. And this up to a rescaling factor is the circulating field and the transmitted field in the system. Down here, these two points are as delta goes to plus infinity and delta goes to minus infinity. What about the reflected field? The reflected field, if you look at its form, look, it has the, it's going to execute a circle just like the transmitted field, but it's displaced. 
it's displaced because it, it also um, has a contribution from the promptly reflected field. So when you look at that uh, reflected field, we're going to have that it traces out a circle. But now it traces out a circle in the D, at d two equals zero or at the origin. And these points are the points at infinity. Let's see if I've got this right. Uh, and I seem to recall that for the sign conventions I've chosen, delta equals kappa over two is down here. Delta equals minus kappa over two is up here. This is delta equals minus infinity. This is delta equals plus infinity. So in the end, you have this uh, another type of resonant object that ends up looking like it has a Lorentzian response in power. But if you ask what's the IQ response, it maps a circle. So harmonic oscillators, their response responses are circles. And that, that I really want you to take that home. It turns out that you can leverage the heck out of that in the lab. Okay. If you want to do phase sensitive detection of things, if you want to think about fundamental limits on your ability to measure things, harmonic oscillators map out circles in IQ plane. Everyone's kind of used to the Lorentzian part, but fewer people are really, like people who do microwave stuff are a little more plugged into the IQ response. It's so easy to access uh, in that domain. So, so I want you to take that home. It's a, it's a really, really powerful thing to, to understand and really grok. Okay. So let's also ask the question. Um, I took, you know, that the input transmission coefficient uh, was equal to the output transmission coefficient. I took the mirrors to be symmetric. But um, what if, oops, T1 does not equal T2? What if they're different from each other? So one mirror is a little more reflective than the other, okay? So what I can, I, I will sort of summarize by saying, in the end, if you look at the circulating if you look over here at E circulating and E transmitted, up to an overall rescaling of the size of the circle, it just remains a circle, where again, delta equals zero is like so. But let's look at the, the reflected field. So there's an overall rescaling of the size, but otherwise it maps a circle. Let's look at the, um, the reflected. We drew the case when they're equal to each other that look like this. And I'm going to put a little open circle here. Maybe I should just make it red or something. I'm trying to going to indicate in different regimes where delta equals zero. This is the delta equals zero point. So if you go to regime where the output mirror has, so this is T1, oh shoot. This is T1 equals to T2. Let's go to a limit where T2, the output mirror, has more transmission than the input. And it turns out that you will still map out a circle in reflection, it will just become smaller. That's this limit. So if this end of the cavity, this end, is more open, it transmits better than the side that I'm trying to inject field on. The reflected field off that input side that I'm driving, it still executes a circle that doesn't change. It's just that you it only changes by a little bit. The diameter gets smaller and the delta equals zero point never approaches the origin. So the, the, you never get a, what's called a reflection dip. Okay, it just becomes smaller and smaller. Let's go to the other limit, which is when I take with me for a second, I'm doing my best to draw a circle. Um, this limit, which is when T1, the input mirror, let me just remind you, 
input, output. Um, when T1 is much, much greater than T2, then in fact, it executes a circle that's centered on the origin. The reflected total reflected power does not change because the length of the phaser is constant. But what does happen is the phase of the reflected field changes in the system. And that's, here's the delta equals zero point. Okay. So for the sake of time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it there, but I really want you to take home that when you go out and you try and build real experiments and you think about harmonic oscillators, carry this picture of, oh, it executes a circle in the IQ plane. Carry that with you. We will actually use this um, later. Eventually, uh, we're going to circle back to this. For now, well, you know what? I'm going to stop and, and see if there are questions. Are there any questions? Oh, when you, it seems that when you drive close to resonance, the lower T you have, the transmission coefficient, the higher EC is. And I guess that I, I I was thinking maybe that can be understood that this transmission T is like damping in a harmonic oscillator, and maybe that, that's why you get that. But then if you have a super low T, does that mean you need to wait a long time to get the steady state? So um, that's exactly right. So if you want to think about steady state, the characteristic time scale to relax to steady state is if at T equals zero, I turn on my drive, then it relaxes to steady state on a time scale one over kappa. Okay. That we've assumed a high finesse cavity. So that time scale is much longer than the round trip time scale. So we're not, this is not a time scale worried about, well, I've got to let this thing bounce back and forth between the mirrors. We've assumed that, you know, really you're going to take so many bounces that the time scale to, to come to some relaxation that we're interested in, that's much, much faster than the round, I'm sorry, much slower than the round trip time. Okay. Over here, I just want to, maybe I should write it out explicitly, um, that kappa, the decay rate, this is, and I'll write it so it's in the notes, that this is 2t divided by tau, tau and I'll call it rnd for round trip. Okay. And so this is the power decay rate. So if I want um, a very, very low power decay rate, I want a very small big T. And that's what people work very hard to build cavities that have very low transmission coefficients that are highly reflecting, which corresponds to very small big T. Did I answer your question? I want to make sure I, I was going yeah. in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. Also, I guess it's, it's a little counterintuitive that when T is zero, then you get some large EZ, but one thinks that EI should never get into EZ. T is exactly zero. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. I, I think one way to think about it is um, the the you, you get to build up for for longer. So like the number like the number of past sort of little spurts of electric field that you get to add up wins out over the fact that each spurt gets smaller. Okay, I think it's. You know, there's like a, like a little spurt of instant electric field that makes it through the mirror. And, and you're sort of comparing, well, how long does that little spurt from a previous one, which is that Green's function picture uh, that we did for harmonic oscillators on the first day. That's what I'm using in my head. How long does that persist compared to the fact that as the transmission coefficient becomes smaller, this, each individual spurt gets shorter? Okay. One way to think about it is the time scale over which those spurts persist, that scales like big T, Right, so as big T gets smaller, but on the other hand, the electric field spurt only scales like square root of big T. Right, and so it's that difference between the scaling with big T and square root of big T that says you went to build up the electric field. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, 
Um, feel free to jump in um, if you realize you have one. I'm going to start writing. So we've talked about harmonic oscillators, and I really love harmonic oscillators because honestly, a pretty good fraction of AMO physics is just straight up harmonic oscillators. In fact, the vast majority of physics is harmonic oscillators. Um, so what can be better than one, one, one harmonic oscillator? What if we do two, two harmonic oscillators? That, that, that has to be even better, right? So let's do two coupled harmonic oscillators. Okay. So um, here's the idea. Let me draw a picture of, of just like a toy model of an example. Okay. So what I have in mind is something that looks like Okay, I've got some stiff wall over here. I have a spring. Um, and I have some mass over here. And I'm going to think of its displacement as x. And then I have a second mass over here. Um, and it has its own spring connected to another wall. Uh, and now I'm going to measure its displacement y over here. And now I'm going to put some other weaker spring in between them and connect them. And so I have coordinates X and Y. We're going to assume no, no damping for this section. So we can just quickly write down the harmonic oscillator equations for this is that we're going to have X uh, plus omega one squared, where that would be the resonance frequency associated with, uh, with the X object over here. So this one, if I, if I were to get rid of that spring, it would resonate at omega one. If I were to get rid of that spring, this one would, would resonate at omega two. Okay. All right. So we have an omega one squared x uh, plus, sorry, equals. We're going to say that there is some characteristic spring strength, which is associated with the coupling. So this is the coupling spring, which I'll characterize via some frequency omega c squared. And if I get a displacement in y, I get an additional force on my system. So if Y moves, it pulls on, on the X coordinate. Similarly, if I look at the Y coordinate, I'm going to have Y double dot is equal, uh, plus, is equal to, sorry, Y double dot plus omega two squared times Y is equal to, it's symmetric, it's an omega C squared uh, times X. So if X moves, Y gets pulled on. Let's uh, go to um, essentially do the, the same operation, which is going to a rotating frame. So let's take um, x equal to the real part of a divided by the square root of omega 1 times e to the i omega 1 t. Yeah. And y equals the real part times B divided by the square root of omega two times E to the I omega two T. You know, let, let's talk about the physical motivation. Essentially what we're going to think about is, well, look, if that spring weren't there, what frequency would these things like to oscillate at? Let's go into those, those frames of reference, okay? So they're not the same uh, uh, frame of reference because they're at different frequencies, but we're going to think this is going into rotating frames. We're going to do this twice in this section. So I'm going to call this rotating frames number one. Great. Let's also assume that that coupling omega C, it's kind of small. So omega C is uh, much, much less than omega one, omega two. So that's another approximation we're going to make. Okay, in that approximation, we can guess that A and B vary very slowly in time. So whenever someone says something very slowly, slowly compared to what? What we mean is in a single period, single period, two pi over omega one or 
mega two. So within the period of the, of the free uncoupled uh, oscillations, the fractional change in the amplitude is small. Great. So if we do that, let's plug in, for instance, uh, to the equation for X. Um, if we do that, we're going to get an A double dot term minus 2i omega 1 times A dot minus omega 1 squared A plus omega 1 squared A is equal to, and now we can shuffle um, these objects around the omegas. So we bring an omega one to this side and omega two is gonna come from this side. And when we substitute in for the Y coordinate, that's gonna give us a B. So the solely varying approximation allows me to go in and say, I'm going to ignore a double dot. Okay. That's what this stuff does. We get to ignore that one. So what we see is we're going to get a cancellation between those two terms. And if we rewrite this and we do the same thing for B, we can rewrite this as um, I a dot is equal to omega over two times e to the i delta t times b. You can do the same for b and say i b dot is equal to omega over two times e to the i minus i delta t times a. So these are classical equations of motion for the, for the classical complex phasor amplitudes, capital A and capital B. So now we're going to do something completely gratuitous. We're going to throw in some H bars, some reduced Planck constants. Um, what we're going to see is that we have a set of first order differential equations that look exactly like the Schrodinger equation. To be suggestive, I will write it in the form I H bar A B with column vector is equal to H bar times zero omega over two e to the I delta T zero, whoops, so in the wrong spot, omega over two times E to the minus I delta T zero. Acting oops, DDT acting on AB. This looks like IH bar DDT acting on some cat over here uh, is equal to some H, except it's a time dependent Hamiltonian acting on the cat psi T has the same form. Let's get rid of the time dependence. The way we're going to do that is we're going to go into another ro rotating frame. Okay, so we are going to say that capital A is equal to little, uh, little a, a new variable, a new complex number, times e to the i delta t, delta over two times t, and b is equal to little b times e to minus i delta over two uh, t. So when we do that, we are going to substitute in Sorry, I had this annoying habit, and I'll try and do my best. I keep wanting to move where I'm writing to the top of the screen, but that doesn't let you see much of it. So I'll try and write near the bottom. Okay, um, great. So now let's, if we substitute in, we can see that what we'll get 
is IH bar DDT. A B is equal to H bar times delta over two, omega over two, omega over two, minus delta over two, acting on AB. It turns out that we can rewrite this if we wanted as saying that this object over here is a Hamiltonian. And then Hamiltonian, we could write it as being equal to H bar delta over two times sigma Z plus omega over two times sigma X, where sigma Z and sigma X are poly spin matrices. Sigma Z is equal to one, zero, zero, minus one. And sigma X is equal to zero, one, one, zero. Poly spin matrices are a pain. They have various sign conventions. These two are easy. Um, so this is a complete aside. This is my attempt to pass on sort of uh, something that I have found useful over time. You can kind of remember sigma y is kind of like sigma x, but it's complex. And so sometimes that part's easy to remember, but then there's this stupid minus sign you gotta figure out. Where does the minus sign go so that when I, evaluate the commutation relationships between these poly spin matrices, everything work out, or it's not the way I want it to, okay? So I'm gonna tell you something. Uh, this is not my own. I was actually, I was in a lecture from Seth Lloyd, um, and he was in a, a lecture and he tells this story. Well, when you think about sigma y, the minus sign is light and it floats to the top because minus sides are light doesn't make sense at all. It's outrageous. And I hope it's so outrageous that it exactly sticks in your head just like it did for me. Minus signs are light and they float to the top, okay? That's how I remember where I put my minus sign. Uh, so thank you, Seth Lloyd, and, and then whoever it was that, that told him that. Minus signs are light and they float to the top. It's outrageous, it's stupid. Hopefully you, re you remember it as a result. Okay, great. So what do we have over here? Let's look at this Hamiltonian. Let's come back to the physics at hand. We have this Hamiltonian that looks like a sigma Z and a sigma X. This really looks like a two level system, which we could label as spin up and spin down, where the spin down state and the spin up state are detuned by some amount delta. And you're trying to couple them with a DC field which tries to couple these two at omega over two. So it turns out that you can map coupled harmonic oscillators and the complex amplitudes associated with them exactly on to, um, to spin half systems. I see a message in the chat, so let me check. Oh yeah, 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 uh, Ian asked, uh, earlier, let's go all the way back to these equations. Why there isn't like a, a Y minus, you know, like why is it this like Y minus X, like some relative displacement? What I've done is, is in fact, that is there. I've actually absorbed some overall frequency shifts associated with applying the coupling into the omega one and into the omega two, okay? It, it's sort of a detail, basically, you, you get overall frequency shifts from having an extra coupling spring. But since we're only interested in kind of relative physics between them, I've ignored that one. And so I, I reduced it to this. Okay, so that was one question for me, and that's a great question. Um, what frequency is the final rotating frame at? Garrett, you're asking that question, I think. This final question, uh, this final one, it turns out that this frame over here, if I remember correctly, it turns out that this is a rotating frame where we've gone to a rotating frame for both objects such that we're in a rotating frame at omega bar equals omega one plus omega two over two. It's actually the average frequency. That's the final frame we end up in. That's a really great question. Uh, I could be wrong on that, but that's what I seem to recall. Okay. Um, 
Well, heck. So then let's let's look at Robbie flopping. Okay, so I, I've got I've got sitting over here um, two pendulas. Let's see. Can you see? Gosh darn it! I'm not sure you can. I wonder if yeah, uh, I think so. Yep. Can you see the bobs at the bottom? Sorry, at least in my view, my name. I, I see two pendula hanging from strings. Uh, two metal something. I'm yep. going to. Um, you 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 might consider stopping sharing because yes, I think that's exactly what I should wrong. do. Um, so let me remember how to do that. Or, or the students can just pin the video. Yeah, I'll just stop share for a moment. And uh, let's see, am I sort of in the main view now? Yes. Let me move the background stuff out so you can see. Okay, so uh, what I've got hanging here, boy, that one's a little hard. My winter hand cream out of the way. Okay, so I've got two pendulas sitting here, and they both would like to swing, but what I've done is I put a little metal rod in between them. And, and what that's going to do is it's going to act like a coupling between, it's going to act like a coupling spring. And so what we're really saying is that, you know, really, Robbie Floppy is saying, I think of it as I'm exciting, say, spin down over here, and it starts swinging. But now, spin up has no probability amplitude in it or any quantum amplitude. And now if I let it go, what happens is spin down couples to spin up, and now spin up is, is moving and is, is excited. And this one was at rest. This is what Robbie floppy is. Okay. When you have a sigma x term that it couples spin up to spin down, you undergo oscillations in between them. There's a complex phase. I really encourage you to go somewhere and build one of these for yourselves. I basically spent all of graduate school with one of these hanging in the lab. Because it turns out there will be a moment where you just really don't believe things and you go over and you swing your little pendula and you go, yeah, 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 that's right. I think I understand what happens. To examine this carefully, you'll even notice that, for instance, when we're working out in the harmonic oscillator, in the harmonic oscillator picture, remember that you have an applied force and there's a 90 degree phase shift because when you apply a force, it takes a quarter of a period for that applied momentum kick to be translated into a displacement. So if you sit here and you watch these carefully enough, this is why you should build one at home or in the lab, that if you watch it carefully, what you'll notice is that when this one starts to get excited, it actually ends up with a 90 degree phase shift compared to the driving one. Now, what happens is now that this has a 90 degree phase shift, when it exerts a force back on the original one, the total force that gets exerted back on the original one is pi out of phase. You get two 90 degree phase shifts because of that delay between converting momentum into position and position is what's associated with the force in the system. So that's why it goes to zero. And the same thing basically happens in quantum mechanics. If you look at the form of those equations, you're saying, look, if you keep track of all the phases in the system, there's a pi phase shift. And actually, as you go through a two pi rotation, what you'll find out is if you had had an identical pendulum in the background and had been oscillating back and forth, you would notice that after it's gone through one cycle of oscillation, you end up with a minus sign. It actually has the opposite phase of oscillation compared to when it started. Often people talk about when I have a spin half system and I rotate it, there's a minus sign that's rather mysterious. It's not, it's classical physics. It's the same minus sign. It appears in coupled harmonic oscillators, okay? So when you basically take this object and you rotate it uh, from spin up to spin down and then back to spin, uh, from spin up to spin down and then back to spin up, you beat a minus sign on the wave function. That same uh, minus sign appears right here. Okay, so I really can't emph emphasize enough sort of the isomorphism between these, these topics. And you can actually just sort of really understand it in terms of classical physics. You see, uh, so have you measured the Q factor of your oscillator? Um, I'm guessing that the Q uh, is closer to sort of like a border like five. What do you think? It looks good to my eyes, yeah. Um, yeah. There's also a good question in the chat, which is, oh, is this what it's like to be an experimentalist? So <laughs> uh, when you're having fun, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've got a question about this rod. So I guess yeah. that is a very, it looks like a tree stick. It's not a very straight rod. I'm just curious what you're using there. <laughs> uh, it's a piece of uh, copper tubing that I picked up. In the oh, line. okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the trick is because these are pendula, it does act a little bit like a spring because of the floppiness. So if you build one of these for yourself and you want to play with it, um, they're great for demos. Um, that you can actually essentially adjust the coupling rate by moving this rod higher and lower. If it's higher, then the coupling becomes smaller. 
if it's lower, the coupling becomes stronger. But essentially, you know, as Ian had asked, um, you know, well, wait a minute, what happens? Shouldn't it be X minus Y on the right-hand side of the equation or Y minus X? Essentially, you end up perturbing the, the sort of the natural resonance frequency as you move the rod down. So it gets a little bit, you know, things become sort of the, the, the uncoupled motion becomes perturbed more and more by the coupling in that case. So you can really actually even just play with the height of this rod uh, and change the effective coupling or the Robbie frequency. And, and not to take you too far afield, but you know, you put in this demo and now you've opened a can of worms. So um, I, because I've seen demos, even done demos, uh, something like this before, I was expecting that I would see these eventually synchronized, like in the Huygens pendulums and things, but I'm not seeing that. So is it just, there's not enough damping here? And that's also something that in some ways is different from a two level system or a couple, well, depends that's what exactly right. So, you know, that, that's a fantastic question. So what, what is really um, never really clearly talked about in the coupled Huygens pendula is that what's really going on is you have dissipation. It is not a unitary dynamics effect, okay? So you have dissipation and that's what drives this um, coupling. Sorry, the name for the, um, oh shoot, uh, the oscillator for this. Anyways, the, the synchronization uh, sort of model that everyone always uses. It, it really relies on dissipation to drive that synchronization process. Essentially, you can think of it as um, initially I have entropy in the system because I have lots of oscillators that have random phases. That entropy goes away. Where does it go? Right. And the answer is it, it's going because there's actually some, some dissipation in the background that's helping you to reach that synchronized state. But, but you don't have any dissipation. I, guess, I think you're thinking Kuramoto model. Is yeah, Kuramoto. Thank you. Yeah. But, but, but what, what, so why don't you have dissipation? You must have dissipation. In, in this case, Q factor is only five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, in, in this case, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think that there's enough dissipation happening up here at the joint that's not common mode. In other words, they're not dissipating into a common bath. And I think that's what's important in the Kuramoto model in order to get synchronization is that you have a common dissipation mechanism. So certain modes damp and other modes don't. And I guess when thinking about spin one halves, this analogy here, um, it may be possible to engineer this common mode dissipation, but typically things like spontaneous emission and dephasing are gonna be more like the dissipation you've got in what you've built here, I guess, is that right? Yeah, that's that's right. The, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned it because eventually we are going to come to thinking about dissipation mechanisms with symmetry involved. And you do get into more complex states. I, wouldn't, I don't know if I want to call them synchronized, but in some sense they are. Uh, so I want to be a little careful at stretching the analogy, but exactly, once you have some symmetry in the coupling to the bath, you can get interesting physics. But, and that's what I do in my lab. I rely on that a lot. Thanks, James. Mm -hmm. I will also point out, you might look at this and go, yeah, okay, fine, Robbie Floppy. You can also do AC start shifts. So for instance, if I were to um, take one of these pendula, wrap the string around in order to shorten it, that would break the degeneracy and frequency. Now I would have a coupling that's off resonance. And you can actually get the same thing as an AC start shift that you calculate, you know, so a light shift that you might apply off resonantly on a two level system. Okay, I, I hope that at least some of you um, are convinced that harmonic oscillators are interesting and that in fact, they might even help you. Um, to think about sort of quantum mechanics and gain intuition. Because in some sense, you really like something in your gut. Like, how does this thing behave? Okay. And it's a very, very hands on thing. So it can be quite nice. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'm going to switch gears again. I think I've responded to everything in the chat. And I'm going to share content again. It will let me. Okay. Um, give me just a moment while I shuffle notes around. Right. So we're now going to turn um, to a different topic. And eventually we're gonna circle back to some of this physics, okay? Um, so um, 
I, I promise there's going to be a connection eventually. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about quantum measurement. And I really want to emphasize that there are really two parts of quantum mechanics. There's a part which is unitary evolution. And that's the part where you have no damping uh, happening in the system. Or none of the second part. And that second part is measurement. And in some sense, sometimes I would claim that, look, I just showed that you can describe the physics of a two-level system with unitary dynamics, and it maps directly onto a classical object. So what's quantum mechanical about a two-level system? And my claim is this. Well, it's the measurement process. And that measurement process is intimately you know, tied back to the fact that you know, different observables don't commute with each other. But the measurement process is where quantum mechanics really kicks in. Okay. But otherwise, I could just have differential equations. You could be like, yeah, I, I bet I could go down to the machine shop and I could get some springs and some masses. I could machine something, you know, some gears from a bicycle. I bet I could engineer this. But where quantum mechanics really kicks in is when you start thinking about fluctuations associated with measurement. So sometimes the measurement process is kind of viewed as, well, it's kind of the, you know, the somewhat unwanted stepchild. Uh, no, it's actually really, really vital uh, in the system. Okay, so with that sales pitch, let's think about two. Okay. I'm gonna follow, so if you're interested in this later, um, I'm going to follow Gardner and Zoller. They have a book called Quantum Noise. And, uh, you know, it's so great uh, that, you know, they're up to the third edition and maybe beyond. Um, but it's, on, it's really early on. It's pages um, 24 to 33. Okay. What they're describing in turn is sort of a measurement theory as established by von Neumann and Carl Caves. Great. Okay, so let's remember the simple case. The one we all learned. Okay, consider an observable A. A hat. Um, with eigenvalues. A sub I and eigenstates a sub i over here. Let's write our wave function as being equal to a sum over some complex weights over these eigenstates of the observable a then the probability to um, get measurement outcome A sub i is just the probability of getting A sub i as a measurement outcome is just equal to A sub i psi magnitude squared. And we can think of this as, well, I have some psi here. 
and I'm acting on it with a projection operator. Which you might think of as a P hat, A sub I. It's a projection operator associated with the eigenstate, with eigenvalue A sub I. Okay. So P sub A, P uh, probability of getting the measurement outcome A sub I is equal to uh, psi P hat. Okay, great. Now, imagine I started with psi and I measure A and I get a measurement outcome A sub I or procedure that we have all been taught. Okay, so, so just to be clear, I am not telling you something you don't know yet. In fact, I'm really not gonna tell you anything you don't know. Uh, but I'm just going to try and do it in a slightly more systematic way and extend it to a different type of problem that you might be used to, to thinking about. Okay. So let's say I had uh, this wave function. We will write that if I start with a wave function psi and I make a measurement of the observable a and I get a measurement of a sub i, I will say psi goes to, given the measurement outcome a sub i, to a wave function psi a sub i which is equal to a projection operator, p hat a sub i associated with the a sub i, acting on the original or prior wave function, and I have to renormalize. And so when we do this, we get c sub i divided by the magnitude C sub i, in this case, uh, times uh, times a sub i. So I go into the given the measurement outcome a sub i, I project into an eigenstate of a, associated with that a sub i. But I will note you will notice that um, there is an overall phase factor that survives this process. Okay, um, that. Normally we ignore it because often when we do the math, it's a global phase factor. And we say, well, global phase factors in quantum mechanics don't matter. And so there's this prior phase factor. Okay. And it's coming from the C sub I. Okay. Um, this is really, I just wanna emphasize generic measurement theory 101. So here's what we want to now extend to. Uh, we want to consider two extensions. We want to, uh, these two expansion, uh, extensions uh, are important for experiments. That's why we're going to do it. There are real experiments that rely on the concepts we're going to do. The first one is a symmetry of the measurement process. And the second one is a case where we say we gain partial information. And as a result, we get partial collapse. So those are the two cases I want to extend to. So let's start and jump in right, right away with number one. And for, so for number one, I'm going to try and build a toy model to help us think about it. Okay, so number one, symmetry. So here's our toy model. We have two spins, two spin one halves in magnetic field gradient. Okay, so I've got, here, here's the deal. I'm imagining I've got like some solid hunk of material and embedded in this solid hunk of material over here, I have a spin one 
at some location. And I have a spin two at some location. And let's pretend like, you know, these are nuclear moments or something. They don't talk to the environment. Let's pretend that for a moment, okay? So whatever's holding them doesn't matter. They can just re maintain their sort of coherence. We now place them in, in some magnetic field gradient. So these are the magnetic field lines. They're diverging. Uh, what does that mean? Well, you know, we have some potential energy associated with coupling um, these objects. And so I'm gonna say, well, look, the part that I'm gonna care about here is actually going to be uh, the interaction of the magnetic moments associated with each of these spins interacting with the magnetic field. And I'm gonna in particular say the magnetic field along Z, okay, the Z component. We're gonna assume that the, there's a big enough bias field on top of this gradient that we can ignore transverse components of this field. So then we're just gonna focus in on V1. And Z, Z hat. Okay. Great. Now let's do a semi-classical thing here. I've got some magnetic moments. Um, and if I have a potential, I know I can get a force uh, acting on these objects. And that force is an F sub Z along Z, which is just going to be minus dV dZ. And so this is just going to give us a mu one plus mu two uh, times B one times Z hat. This uh, kind of uh, potential is actually used all the time in experiments. It's called a magnetic bottle. Um, and you use it for, for instance, uh, you know, uh, holding on to charged particles, holding on to, um, for instance, if you spin polarized a gas, this kind of thing. Okay, you can confine the, the atoms. So it's called a magnetic bottle. There is a force and that force is going to be along Z. Okay. So um, when I did this, uh, I think I need to be careful about my, my vectors here. I've now gone into the projections along Z here. And the force is what's along Z, okay, so component, Ah, I'm erasing everything. Zalon Z. What does that mean? Okay. Well, what that means is I could imagine. Here's here's my experiment now. Um, I'm going to take this little block of material over here, and I'm going to weigh it. And I'm going to have some reference mass over here. Let's see here. So here's my little balance over here. This is the one that has the spins embedded in it, and it has the magnetic field gradient. This bottle term over here. Okay, so let's consider um, the eigenstates that we can be in. Well, we're going to label our spin states as spin one and spin two, which are labeling different locations uh, in this block. And if we ask, if both atoms are in spin up, then what we're going to get is an extra force along Z, which is equal to some gyromagnetic ratio related, you know, like, you know, like my spin to an actual magnetic moment uh, times the B1 coefficient over here. And so we think of it as, well, that would show up as a, as a different tilting of my balance, right? So we can think of it as I can measure that force, whether that force is present, and we'll call that measurement outcome if we measure that, we'll call that, say, a measurement outcome A plus over here. And we will associate with what we will operate on the system with if we get that measurement outcome is P hat plus, which is just going to be a projection operator up, 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 up. It's the same thing for spin down. This is going to apply a force F sub Z, which is minus gamma V1. We'll call that outcome A minus. And there will be a P minus operator that we'll use to project or collapse our wave function. And we'll call that one down, 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 down. Great. But now there's a little bit of ambiguity. because it turns out there are two different states that could lead to a single observable. And this is the symmetry aspect. Let's consider down, sorry, up, down. 
as well as down, up, or frankly, any combination, uh, C1, up, down, so a superposition state, C2, down, up. They all lead to a measurement outcome of F sub Z equals zero. There's no net force. Because in all those wave functions, one spin is up and one spin is down. There's no net force. So we can call that outcome A sub zero over here. And it will have associated with it a projection operator, which we will call P zero. And it needs to be symmetric in a complete basis. Okay, so we need to span the full Hilbert space. So we could write it in terms of triplets and singlets, but we can also write it in terms of spin up, down, down, whoops. Up, down, plus down, up, down, up. The reason for that is it's symmetrized. I can, you know, basically I, I can't tell the difference which which configuration gave me this measurement outcome. That's the symmetry I'm talking about. So let's take it as an example. Um, let's take the trivial one, and then we'll we'll keep circling it on to onto the interesting part. So if I start with a psi, which is equal to up down. And I get a measurement outcome. Well, in fact, the probability of getting this measurement outcome is one. Then I will get a wave function, a sub zero. Can, the wave function conditioned on getting the measurement outcome, a sub zero, which is equal to p hat zero acting on psi, the prior psi, divided by a renormalization coefficient down here, which is psi acting on p zero hat. Psi. What do we get from this? Well, uh, if you follow it through, you're going to end up with up, down. The wave function is unchanged by the measurement by that measurement outcome. But what if let's do something a little more non-trivial, not generic, but let's just take something uh, concrete. What if we had psi? is equal to one over root two times spin up for spin one plus spin down for spin one times one over root two times spin up for spin two plus e to the i phi times spin down for spin two. So we've been writing things in terms of this kind of joint basis where we say a ket, you know, up, up. Um, so let's rewrite in that basis what, what this wave function is, okay? So we get a net factor of one half times four, times four terms over here. So we get a term that looks like up, up. We get a term that looks like um, plus down, up. No, I'm gonna do it in a different order, sorry. plus an e to the i phi times down down plus down up plus e to the i phi up down. Okay. Where now I've subsumed these labels of one and two, the subscripts into the positions in the cat, just like we were doing before. Great. So let's do the same procedure now. If I start with the ket psi and I get a measurement outcome, a naught, which is not guaranteed now, right? It's not guaranteed anymore. The probability is one. But having gotten that, then having gotten that, the new wave function is psi sub a zero is equal to, we apply the projection operator associated with a zero, I think we called it uh, just P sub zero, 
we act on the prior wave function and then we divide by the square root of psi times the operator p naught psi and this is about renormalization on the bottom and when we do this what we're going to find out is well we're going to end up with one half times up down up down up plus e to the i phi up down divided by the square root of one fourth plus one fourth from the two terms which you get in the bottom. And so in the end, we get a normalized wave function psi conditioned on getting the measurement outcome a naught. And given the prior wave function, which is up here, we get a new wave function that actually is just a normalized wave function where now I have down up plus e to the i phi up, down. So in words, what's, what's going on here? Um, one, if we get the measurement outcome, A naught, it projects or collapses all the parts of the wave function consistent with that measurement outcome. And it does so coherently, i.e. phases are preserved in this process. This is the global phase, this phase right here, this phase. This is the phase at the very beginning. I said, oh, this thing persists, but normally we ignore it. Well, actually it matters now, okay? And it's in part because of, well, what, what was the, your prior wave function? Because look, it, that, that phase factor becomes like some overall global phase factor in the system. You know, if I started with, for instance, in this case, where I started with just the, the trivial case up down, okay. Then in that case, well, like, look, phase factors don't really matter. There's just an overall phase factor. But there are special cases where because of the symmetry of the measurement process, that different configurations give you the same measurement outcome, that actually now I can have phase factors and even complex numbers, if I'd written down a more generalized wave function, that survive. And this is really important, okay? And it's gonna be at the heart of what are called making quantum non-demolition measurements for creating entangled states. And that's where we're gonna go with this eventually, the survival of those phase factors. More generally, I said phase factors, the survival of the amplitude coefficients from the original uh, wave function. Okay, um, before we proceed further, um, we're going to do a little bit of work to formalize this just a little more. Okay. So, okay. So let's imagine uh, again. Let's let's step back and define our notation that we have some observable a in their eigenstates of that observable, uh, which we will label with n, and the measurement outcomes of that observable are a sub n, and the eigenstates are n. Um, then let's take all the possible n's in the system to be a complete basis. Great. So this is just saying if we sum over n, uh, over here, we that this is identical to the unity uh, operator over here. Okay. Each of these individual terms will label as the projection operator P sub n. Okay. So now Let's define the symbol A bar. And A bar does not mean average in this case. It's a symbol I'm, I'm pulling out of thin air to mean it is uh, a measurement outcome used to estimate Uh, 
Uh, what was the measurement outcome of A? Okay. Those don't necessarily have to be quite the same things. So I make some measurement. I'm trying to make a measurement of uh, A, uh, but I get some measurement outcome, which may or may not be exactly A. They may have some like intrinsic fuzziness associated with that. Okay. And so they're close, but they're not quite the same thing. You'll see what we mean by that, okay? So we de define a probability amplitude operator. As a Y hat for the measurement outcome A bar, which is equal to the sum over all possible states, n, y hat, sorry, no hat on this one, a probability amplitude, a bar associated with the state n, times a projection operator associated with the n state. Okay. Um, what are the y a bar n's? Uh, these are equal to the square root of the probability that if I am in state n, that I get a measurement outcome A bar. So if I'm in a certain state, what's the probability that my measurement apparatus will return a value A bar? Okay. And it could be that when I make my measurement, there are two different measurement outcomes if I'm in state N that can return an a, a certain A bar. Okay. And we'll, we'll come to an explicit case where that's true. That's why we want to introduce this formalism. So um, I do want to say that we're now officially over time with the lecture. Oh, so, sorry, uh, totally. Uh, I don't know why so I had, I, I had an extra oh, sorry, 10 minutes. Let me stop here. Do, are there any questions to this point? I'll take it back up uh, when we start next time. Totally cool. Surely there's questions because James hasn't even dared mention the word cross operator yet. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention cross operator. Uh, I'll leave that for, for other people. Um, okay. Uh, I, 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 I worry that sometimes the cross operator ends up like losing physical intuition. And um, look, if you get serious about this stuff, at the end of the day, you're going to go engage with the literature. The key is you want to take some intuition away from what's going on here. And so we're going to apply it to a specific problem uh, that's going to help you to understand how a measurement process that has some quantum fuzziness associated with it how does that quantum fuzziness alter the final state that you get uh, when you do this projection, op uh, projection operation? That's where we're going. So since there's no uh, questions good. yet, I'm gonna make a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, I, I, I texted this to, to Caden privately. So I mentioned yesterday, I have a hobby of what I call theorist baiting. And because you're not a theorist, I really can't bait you, James, but one of my theorist baiting hobbies is to, uh, I like to make declarative statements. And declarative statement I like to make in this context is there's no such thing as quantum noise. And what I really mean by that is that the only noise that's present in quantum mechanics is the classical quantum interface. And uh, I wonder if you have any comments on that. Um, yeah, I would say that the problem is I live in I live in the classical world, and um, and that somehow when I go and look at my quantum object, man, it sure looks like it's noisy. But you're absolutely right that until I make that connection to the classical world, it's all unitary dynamics. There, there's no like you know often people talk about like quantum fluctuations drive phase transitions. Well, I'm not so sure about that. 
Oh yeah, um, so that 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 one drives me quite crazy. Like, okay, if you look at it, it's not just me. I, I look at it and go, no, 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 no. Like until I open my box up and I get some collapse, which essentially is equivalent to the environment making a measurement on my system. No, it's all unitary. Yeah, so that, so that one. Is, so in that sense, I'm I'm totally on board with you. Um, yeah. So. So, so that one is like a popular literature kind of thing that that's when I say there is no such thing as a quantum fluctuation. The system is not fluctuating. It's in a completely constant state. Size and it's, your, it's your ridiculous insistence to express it in terms of the wrong basis that leads you to the false conclusion that there are fluctuations. Yeah. So I, I would claim that, um, you know, what I was saying, you know, look, here's this like two level system, which is coupled harmonic oscillators. And yet it has the same Schrodinger equation, um, et cetera. Like there are no quantum fluctuations in that. It's just a first order differential equation. There are no fluctuations. It's really when we start thinking about the quantum measurement process and interfacing with exactly like you said with the classical world, where you go, wait a minute, now th there seem to be these fluctuations I observe in the system. And that's really as best I can understand. Um, there are people who probably have thought more carefully about this than me. But I really think that's associated with the second part of quantum mechanics. It's that measurement. It's the interfacing to a classical world where you begin to notice these fluctuations. That's that's where they appear. Okay. I'm waiting for a successfully baited one one theorist here. If uh, so, so you know, you made this comment about talking about quantum fluctuations and phase transitions, things like this, and and so of course I agree with you that if you look in the right basis, uh, there are no fluctuations. It's just the state, right? Um, but the issue is that all observers, uh, whether you're explicitly doing a measurement or not, um, have a notion of locality. I don't get to pick the global basis. I only get to pick the basis in my light cone or in my subsystem of the, you know, my subset of the universe. And the point of uh, entangled systems, right, is that you can't pick a basis in that subsystem where I look like a pure state. So there you unavoidably are sort of, if you want it, you can say you're doing a measurement if you want, you just don't have access if you to did a measurement externally. But, but Gaiden, you, but the, the reason that you can never, you can no longer describe the system with the single wave function is because you made a measurement on it locally. I mean, I, I would say there is no wave function in the subsystem, right? So if, if I live on one spin out of a million, there is no way to describe the state of that one spin without referring to the other million spins. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And so that's, that's a, you know, so whether you do a measurement or not, you can't describe the evolution of that one spin. Either you have to treat it as an open system or you have to include the other million spins. And so eventually you always run into this with any correlated system that, you know, uh, there's this locality structure. But, but, but to some degree, the, the, um, what you're having to do is having to do with exactly the idea that you're going to somehow have to trace over the other spins. Cause you say, I just can't keep track of them. That tracing operation for me, that's measurement. And that's, yeah, it's, that's a, it's a measurement where you don't look at the measurement outcome. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Because, because, you know, like for, for me, like measurement is exactly that trace operation to me, they're identical. I made the measurement the universe made the measurement measurement. And then I just, I, I did a statistical average over that and I ignored it the information I gain. And I'm used to that perspective because that's that's the world I live in where we, we drive some dynamics and then we actually get some information. If we ignore that information, sure enough, it just looks like a, you know, it's an unentangled state. It's, it's completely uninteresting. If we use that information, we realize we can actually modify like the type of state we're generating exactly like I'm describing here. So I think, well, but I think this helps maybe give perspective on why when you talk about quantum fluctuations at a phase transition or something, why, why this may make sense, even though, you know, what, what, why you almost have to pick a basis that isn't good. You know, Ian says, why don't we pick the right basis? Well, the answer is if you're a local thing, you can't. There is no such basis. I, I buy that. But, you know, to some degree, I think this, this is kind of an argument that goes back to like, you know, spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, I guess I really don't, I don't really feel like no spontaneous such thing. symmetry breaking. Um, I think spontaneous symmetry breaking is measurement. Um, so, uh, you know, basically the second half of quantum mechanics comes in and we use lots of different words for it, but it's really that second half, it's measurement. It's your, your coupling to some other apparatus that lives in the classical world. I, 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 I don't think there's anything wrong with the language. I think it's just important to understand like, what, what do we mean by it? That's all, that's all. Well, I think that my, my objection with language is the sort of 
inging sense of the verb, like doing something, that a state is not, a grass state is not doing anything. So when he says fluctuating, it implies a sense of action, which is totally uh, uh, untrue. That the, like the ground state of the universe with quote quantum fluctuations describing the active vacuum is a complete fiction. It's just a superposition state. It's not inging at all. And that is the fundamental core of my issue with fl quantum fluctuations is they imply a fluctuating state that is dynamical in time, which is uncorrelated with reality in every possible way. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I, I think that, I think the key is you have to understand in what context you want to refer to it as quantum fluctuations. Yeah. So I'm, I'm down with it so long as you understand what, what you mean. And I, look, I could be wrong. I, I can imagine there are people who have thought about this very subtly. But I, I think that when, when sort of many body folks refer to this, it's in the sense that Caden has referred to it. They're really yeah, having like, to trace over some other degrees of freedom. Yeah, the ground state is an admixture of many localized states. And to, to connect with the popular literature, it's convenient to call it fluctuating. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, f fluctuation up question is on a noun, Ian. It's derived from a verb, but fluctuation is a noun. So I, it sounds to me like you don't like fluctuating, but... Uh, <laughs> Because when, read, bad because when you read that, because when you talk to someone who's not a physicist, they actually believe that it is dynamically fluctuating with particles coming in and out of the vacuum as a function of time, and as that is the thing that causes my frustration with this word. So, so what's a good word for a mixture of several things that? Uh... This, is, this is the popular literature communication issue that is, is not not within something that I'm I'm trying to solve right now. It, it's purely a language issue, but the problem is that for first year graduate students, it sort of leads to a pervasive problem about the, the, what you think about the nature of a, a strongly correlated quantum state. Um, I, I noticed that uh, one of the attendees had, um, had made themselves invisible, make me think that either they told us, hey, look, we all need to go take a break. Can you guys stop talking? Uh, or they had a question. <laughs> Uh, Charles, did you have a question? I don't mean to put you on the spot. If you did, I can't hear you at the moment, but that's okay. I'm not trying to put you on the spot. So um, I, I uh, dropped out of uh, the call for a sec, but I wanted to ask a follow-up about this. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very related to what you talked about today, but like, what does this mean for how we interpretate a ground state like a quantum spin liquid where quantum fluctuations are supposed to have something to do with lack of order? Like, how, how does this problem of, like, measurement come into how we interpret a, a state like that? I guess I'm, I, I know less about what a quantum spin liquid is supposed to be based off of this conversation. I, I, so I think I will, it sounds like Katie might be a good person to address that one. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm all for that, Ian. Um, so, uh, you know, I think we can adopt both James and Ian's perspective of forgetting the word fluctuation just because it could lead to a confusion. So a, a quantum spin liquid is just a superposition of many spin configurations where there's no um, average order. So if I were to just look on average, do the spins all point in the same direction? No, they don't. And they don't point in some average spiral pattern. If you just average it, the average spin is zero. It's equally likely to be up or down or left or right at every site. But, um, but uh, so it's a superposition of all these different configurations. That's uh, at the end of the day. And it's a superposition that persists down to zero temperature or very low temperature. And this is kind of a negative definition. You're saying it's a thing that's a superposition. Well, isn't everything a superposition? You know, it, it, and the answer is pretty much yes. Um, but uh, but uh, it turns out that once you have these ingredients, it necessitates a bunch of other exotic things like fractional particles and all that stuff, which is why people care, right? So a better definition is probably to define it by the things that we care about. To define a spin liquid is a thing that has fractionalized particles or something because then it's clear why you care, but that's not how people usually introduce it for the first time. They say it's this fluctuating orderless thing, but really it just means it's a superposition of lots of spin configurations with no order. I see, thanks, thanks. Sometimes it has order, right? Like parity or something, count the number of bonds and then there's no fluctuations, right? That's right. You, you, you could have a spin liquid that also breaks a symmetry, for example, but has liquidity 
other than that symmetry. Yeah, good point. Like in the SUN stuff I mentioned yesterday, you know, it's a, the chiral spin liquid breaks the chiral order, like Vibhav is saying. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Are there further questions for James, but not Caden? <laughs> I, I, maybe I, I want to ask a question. Uh, I know it's a little bit late, but so, um, and it is related to the discussion that we had yesterday that I hope also connects with now that we started talking about measurement, which is, uh, at least in my understanding, uh, sometimes the notion of non-classicality of what is quantum and what is not in, in certain degree depends on what type of measurement you're doing, right? And an example is uh, squeeze states, right? Uh, like from the discussion yesterday, uh, I will conclude, well, squeeze states are completely classical, right? But if you're, but if you're counting photons, then uh, the statistics, it's actually, there is no classical point process that will reproduce those statistics. So in a sense, uh, you need to include measurement, uh, right? Or like, I, I was wondering if you can comment in, into that. Yeah, let me, um, let me draw a, a picture really quickly just to frame the discussion for everyone. It's a, it's a fantastic question. Um, so you could imagine that when I draw phase space um, that, the idea was that we had some, um, we modulated the, the, um, the instantaneous frequency of my harmonic oscillator twice the, the resonant frequency of my harmonic oscillator. And when we did that, we saw that, look, um, you could go from say a phase space sort of patch and phase space that looks like this to a patch and phase space that looks like this where the area is conserved because of Louisville's theorem, okay? And that was all classical. So for instance- I guess we're, we're not this, seeing uh, you're not right. seeing the video at the moment? Yeah. I thought I had shared it. Let me try it again. Darn it. Uh, two, one, any second now. Great. Okay. So we looked in phase space, you know, say X and P up here. And you're absolutely right. So I can basically say that the source of noise in this system is classical noise. It could come from the fact that I have a thermal object. And so where I start, because I'm at finite temperature, um, I say, well, there's some phase space distribution described by this original circle, right? I just put one half KBT of, of energy into every uh, quadratic degree of freedom of my harmonic oscillator. And that gives me this distribution. If I parametri parametri parametrically drive this thing after I've decoupled it from the bath, so, so at least it's frozen during the dynamics, I just shear, or not shear, but I, I modify a phase space like this. And so you could also say, well, look, the noise isn't coming from finite temperature coupling to a bath. It's actually coming from quantum mechanics. It's the vacuum noise in the system. And so, but it turns out that you can use that exact same mechanism. You can actually, you know, squeeze the vacuum noise associated with a harmonic oscillator or, or an optical field. And if what you're interested in doing is making displacement measurements or making heterodyne or homodyne, let's say homodyne style measurements of that field, there really isn't a significant difference between them. But it's exactly like you said, if you actually, for instance, do photon counting uh, statistics, and for instance, you ask, what's the parity of the, of the Fox state that I measure? Well, for if it's actually the vacuum that's being squeezed, I'll notice I only get zero, two, four, six, eight as measurement outcomes per, pho per photon number or per phonon number, so I'll knock oscillator. So there are definitely measurements that you can do that let you distinguish between a classical system and a quantum system. But notice it involved measurement again. I did do like I have to specify my measurement. So you're 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 dead you're dead on accurate. All right. So since we are now 20 minutes after the official end of the lecture, I'm going to ask my question: If are there any life-saving or ending questions? And if the answer is yes, please ask them now so that no fatalities associated with this conference. Um, otherwise, we'll have one more opportunity to, to ask questions of James. And in that circumstance, I will see all of you tomorrow. So are there any more of the sort of universe ending, 
Marvel Comics kind of questions that need to be posed. Good. All right, so Glad I'm not putting the fate of the universe uh, in issue. So we'll, we'll go ahead and start with this uh, slide or notes tomorrow uh, for James's lecture. And I look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for, I believe, Monica's lecture will be first tomorrow morning. So have a great evening and see you all tomorrow. Good night.